favorite in- intros now, right? Uh, uh, I love that. Does anybody kind of just nod your head a little bit while that intro's going on? It's so good. Uh, and I think this word fits well. It's fresh, right? So that's what all the cool kids are saying. Yes, no. Uh, well, neither here nor there. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Glad you're here, and uh, thanks for braving the weather, right, and the threat of weather. Uh, I assume everybody is uh, uh, milk and bread. You got it all because there's nothing left of the store, so uh, for the imminent snowmageddon that's heading our way, evidently. Uh, but uh, we're so glad you're here today. Um, if you're here for the first time or back for the first time in a bit, uh, I want to say welcome home. My name's Pat. I'm the campus pastor here, and it's a joy to have you with us. And today we're heading into uh, part two of a series we kicked off last week that's all about the mind that we're calling Renew. And uh, I I don't know about you, but but I believe this. Our minds are pretty important. What we choose to do with what goes on up here really goes a long way because before any action ever takes place in our life, I don't know if you ever thought about this, before any action ever takes place in our life, it first is formed where? right up here in our minds, right? And so thought precedes behavior. Thought precedes behavior and action. And so what we do with what we think about really goes a long way in who we are and really what our life might be like. And so I think we can all agree our minds are pretty critically important, right, to who we are and who we become. And if we want things to be better out here, I think it would be safe to say they need to get better up here, right? So we've got to take care of our minds if we want things to get better. And all of us want things to get better, right? We want a better life. We want to experience life to the full. Jesus wants us to experience life to the full. That is a desire of his for us. So much so he says in John chapter 10, verse 10, we read this verse last week. Jesus said this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And then he counters it by saying, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the what? To the full, right? That I would have life abundantly. Like this is the desire of Jesus for our lives, that we would have life. And our word life in the Greek is, it's the word zoe. Everybody say zoe. Very good over there, very good. Zoe, right? It, uh, it, It means this, you're all scholars now, Greek scholars. It means absolute life, the purest kind of life, or life in its essence, like to the core, life to the full, life more uh, abundantly. And I think to experience that kind of life, it requires some intentionality on our part. It requires that we intentionally make a decision to live differently every single day if we want to experience the full life that Jesus has come and he has given to us, right? We gotta make that intentional decision to live differently. But here's what you have to know. If we're gonna make that intentional decision to live differently, it means we're gonna have to begin to think differently, right? Because thought precedes action. Thought precedes behavior. And so if we want to live differently, we're gonna have to start thinking a little differently, right? Meaning we've gotta get control of our minds. And so our mind, it is the battlefield where this war is going to take place, right? Our mind is where everything begins. Our mind is the battlefield. And here's what I know. If we want life to get better, if we want to experience life to the full, we got to win this battle in our mind. And so we're going to talk and continue to talk for the rest of this series about how to win this battle that's in our minds. And so let's start where we left off last week, our theme verse for this whole series, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when we don't conform and when we are transformed by renewing our minds, then and only then we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. We'll know his way, know his will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And here's what I know, and here's what you know. The longer we live in the world, the more the world pushes us to fall into the pattern of its thinking, yes? Right? We're kind of pushed in that direction of thinking the way that the world thinks. It's easy to fall into the pattern of the world. And Paul says in this letter he wrote to the church in Rome, he says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world. And what he's framing here, I want to bring this up again because it's important. When Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of the world, he's framing this idea of groupthink. 
And if you don't know what groupthink is, groupthink is, is basically this. When a large enough pool of people, and when you get a large pool of people together, I think you could call it a group, right? When you get a large group of people thinking a certain way about a certain thing, it becomes very easy for people to look at the way they think about that and say that's the normal way to look at that subject, right? And so large groups of people, when they begin to think a certain way about a certain thing, can easily persuade one or two people who are a part of a group to fall into line in the pattern of thinking, right? We see it happen all the time in our world, right? I mean, Twitter, how many of you know what Twitter is? Right, for the most part, we all know what Twitter is. It is amazing to me that a group of people can begin to say something about a certain subject, and it becomes, it seems, the norm that the world thinks, right? Like, that's groupthink. That's falling into a pattern of thinking. And Paul pushes back against this, and he tells us, do not conform any longer to the pattern of thinking of the world. Don't conform to it. You've got to be countercultural in the way that you think. And so here's a very important question. How are we countercultural in the way that we think? How do we not conform to the pattern of the world? Paul says, easy, renew your mind. Renew your mind. How do I renew my mind? How am I countercultural in the way that I think? Here's what I think countercultural thinking is, where we do not longer, any longer conform to the pattern of the world, right? We must hold to and follow the teachings and the way of Jesus. There is nothing more countercultural than the teaching of Jesus. Love your enemy. Is that countercultural? Yes, the world says eliminate your enemies to achieve peace. Jesus is love and pray for your enemies to achieve true peace. This is countercultural. And so Paul would push back and say, do not conform any longer to the pattern, the group think of the world, but instead be transformed by following a different way. We're going to have to begin to renew our minds, be transformed by doing what you know Jesus has taught. And so this is going to have to be something that takes a little effort on our part. This is a fight we are going to have to engage in because here's why it's important. The more we think a certain way about a certain thing, the easier it is to think that way over and over and over again, right? Science would call that neurological pathways, where a path is worn in our minds where it's easy for that thought to travel back and forth. I gave you this picture last week, um, <clears throat> and I think it's a really good picture talking about grooving a path. How many of you have a dog? Anybody have a dog? Yeah? How many of you have a cat? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I just wanted to ask for the fun of it, but <clears throat> the dog has a little relevance here today. I have cats, but um, <clears throat> if your dog is outside, you know, and if you have nice grass, you know that you, now you had nice grass, right? Because the dog will run back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in a certain spot in a certain way, and he'll wear or groove a path, right? The grass will wear out, a groove will form, and you will be able to see where the dog has traveled back and forth. And when we begin to think, keep that picture in your mind, when we begin to think a certain way about, about a certain thing, Grooves can be formed in our minds where that same thought can travel back and forth very easily. And it becomes a normal pattern of thinking for us. It's true when we think positively, but it is also especially true when we think negatively, right? Those paths are formed. And so it is critical that we begin to really think about <clears throat> what we're thinking about. Because along those paths in our minds, these big, big things of thinking can get set up. They're called strongholds. Strongholds can set up in our minds. What is a stronghold? I'm glad you all asked today. What, what is a stronghold? A stronghold is this. Like, it's a fortress. Like, think of a, <clears throat> a, a big castle, a fortress, fortified walls, right, uh, that keeps things in and keeps other, other people out, right? These things can form in our mind, right? It's, it's a fortress of wrong thinking. And when certain ways of negativity begin to form in our mind, strongholds can set up. An example of a stronghold would be this. Fear could be a stronghold. We begin to live in fear because we think and believe a certain way, right? Lust can become a stronghold. 
in our minds where we no longer look at people as God's image bearers, but instead we look and view them how they can satisfy our selfish desires, right? It's a pattern of wrong thinking. Lust can be a stronghold. Anger can be a stronghold where that becomes our first response to everything. Anger, hatred, unforgiveness, even religion can be a stronghold where the rules overwhelm us and we're only concerned with that and that alone. And the list could go on and on. These strongholds, these fortresses of wrong thinking can set themselves up along the normal pattern of the way that we think. It's why Paul pushes us, listen, it's critical, don't conform any longer to the pattern of the world. We must be renewed. Strongholds can set up, and they come in many shapes, many forms, many fashions, but they all have this one thing in common. Every stronghold exists first in the mind. This is where it begins. And when a stronghold is set up, it can begin to dictate the way that obviously we think, but what we think it also dictates our behavior. So it's important. And if strongholds remain and get set up long enough, they can keep us from living and experiencing the life that Jesus has come to give us, this full, abundant life. And here's what I believe. <clears throat> you can be born again. If you don't know what born again is, it's a fancy church word. If you've been saved, you're a Christ follower now. I, I think you can be a Christ follower. You can come to church on Sundays. You can brave Snowmageddon and come to church on a Sunday morning. You can sing songs. You can clap. And when God does miracles, you can clap on beat. When the band is playing, you can lift your hands, sing at the top of your lungs. You can serve on a team and do all of those things, but still not experience the full life that Jesus has come to give. All because... Our pattern of thinking is wrong, right? We're trapped in the way that we think in our minds, right? We've conformed, even though we're doing things that are good and positive, but we formed wrong patterns of thinking in our minds, and we are trapped and conforming as opposed to being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And if God doesn't have control of what's happening in here, then obviously our behavior is not going to match. Life is going to be out of sync. And we're not going to experience the full life that Jesus has come to give us. And so to change who we are, here's what I think. To change who we are, we have to change how we think. Got to begin to work on our minds. And here's the great news. Are you ready for some good news? God wants us to win this battle. He does. And he has given things to us to help us win the battle. And we are going to talk about those things today that can help us win the battle in our minds. But here's what you must know. God's not going to force himself upon us. In other words, you just can't sit back and expect this just to happen. This is something we must engage in. After all, this is a battle, and we must fight this battle <clears throat> in our minds. The Apostle Paul, who we've talked a lot about, and anytime you're in church and you talk about the Bible, the New Testament, so over 70% of it was written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, um, who, who obviously penned most of the New Testament, he writes this letter to a group of people, to a bunch of Christ followers, in a town called Corinth. And so he writes to people in Corinth, and the title of the letter is, can anybody guess? Yeah, Corinthians, right? He writes to people in Corinth, they're called Corinthians. And so Paul writes this letter to them, actually a couple that we have in our scriptures, and this church is struggling. And, and as a matter of fact, just to encourage you a little bit, uh, after the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John, right, a after the Gospels come the story of the church, right, the people of God. And the letters were written because the followers of Jesus were struggling and working out the teachings of Jesus in their lives together. Right? So, so th that's why this stuff exists, because it can be a struggle. And God wants us to win the battle in, in, in life. And so he, he inspires these people to write these incredible letters to his people. And so in 2 Corinthians, as these people are struggling with their culture, with their thinking, <clears throat> he, he writes this letter. And I want to start in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians and verse 3. And this is so important. Uh, he says this. For though we live in the world, we live in the world, yes? For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does, right? 
So I want you to keep that in your mind. I'm going to come back to it in just a little bit. <clears throat> For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish what? Strongholds. We know what strongholds are now, right? These weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we must take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Notice the strong language. We must take captive a few thoughts. Nope, that's not what he says. We must take captive what thoughts? Every, 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 every thought. Every thought. What, what does that tell us? What does that language tell us? What we think matters. So much so that every thought that comes across our minds needs to go through the filter of Jesus. Every thought why would Paul say every thought? Because we must be very wise in considering what we give authority over us in our minds, right? Every thought. Why does every thought matter? Here's why. Because your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. This is why every thought matters. Why does every thought matter? Because everything that comes into your mind eventually works its way out into your life because thought always precedes behavior. Right? It matters. Every thought matters because you cannot have a negative mind and a positive life at the same time. It's just impossible. Why does every thought matter? Here's why. Because if my thoughts are out of control, consequently my life is going to be out of control. And so Paul uses very strong language here, like the language of war and weapons, and take every thought captive. Like these are the pictures he's painting, right? We live in the world but we don't wage war the way the world does. Let, let me kind of explain this to you. This made me laugh when I thought of it this week, right? We live in the world, but we don't wage war the way the world does. We're not going to take a gun, point it at another person and say, change the way you behave so that my thought life will get better, <laughs> right? That's completely ridiculous, but that's the way that the world does war, Yes. Paul says, we're not going to fight that way. You can't point a gun at someone else and tell them to change so your thought life can get better. That's, that's ridiculous. We can't control others. We can't control what they say. We can't control what they do. But the one thing we can control is what? It is ourselves. It is our thought life, right? We are responsible for our thought life. Other people are not. We need to hear that, right? Our thought life is only going to change when we begin to take every thought captive and run it through the filter of the way of Jesus. And so our battle is going to look different, right? The weapons that we fight with are not intended to hurt or wound others, but they are intended rather to transform and change us. And the hope is as we are transformed and changed, as we are renewed, then that renewal would work its way out into our lives and then begin to show the people around us there is a better way to find life to the full. But it starts first in us, most importantly, in our minds. And so this battle that we fight in our minds, it is a spiritual battle. Our weapons are different. They have power to tear down the strongholds, the ways of negative thinking that are in our minds that push us to conformity. These weapons have power to move us from conforming to the pattern of the world to rather being transformed by the renewing of our mind. These weapons have power where instead of our thoughts taking us captive, now we can take our thoughts captive and we can own them and take authority over our minds in the name of Jesus to ensure that we are honoring God instead of dishonoring God with the way that we think. And so what I want to do is, is very quickly, I want to chat about the weapons that we have to fight with. And these are very important things that we're talking about. These are cornerstones, essentials, basics of Christianity. If we did nothing but what we're about to talk about, we would experience life to the full. Like, this is it. And so this is very important, what we're talking about. If we want a renewed mind, we want to take thoughts captive, we want to experience life to the full, not just for ourselves, but also people around us experience, we've got to put these weapons into play in our lives. And again, 
These are not meant to change others. These are meant for us because the battle is in our minds. So what are <coughs> these weapons that uh, we have to fight with? Here they are. First one is this, is the weapon of the word. Now, when I say the weapon of the word, I don't mean words that I'm speaking. When I say the word, I mean this, right? The Bible, or as I often refer to them as scriptures, right? Scriptures are so critically important. It is a weapon that we have to fight the battle in our mind. If you want your mind renewed, if you want strongholds to come down, then I suggest you begin to get the word of God, the scriptures, into your life. Get them into your mind and begin to wrestle with them. Ephesians chapter 6 calls the word the sword of the spirit. Right? It names it as a sword, not one we wield with our hands, but rather one that works in our minds. And it changes us and begins to work in us. Psalm chapter 1 says this, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But, verse 2, this is what I want you to listen to here, but his delight is in the law or the way of the Lord. And on his law... On God's way, he meditates day and night. Meditates day and night. We get the word of God into our lives by meditating on it often. Now, when I say meditating on it, I don't mean some Eastern cross your, you know, cross your legs and, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm, so it's all, that's all well and good, but when I say meditating, it's not about emptying your mind, but rather it's about filling your mind. When I say meditating on scriptures, here's what I mean. Thinking on them, pondering on them, sometimes memorizing them, discussing these things with other people that you're learning. That's part of meditation. Using the Google machine to do some research so that you can further wrestle with the scriptures and understand them in a greater way. This is all meditating on scripture. It's pondering, it's engaging with it, it's not just scanning over it, but rather it's taking your time with it. This is what it means to meditate on the word of God, on the scriptures. And it is the weapon that we have to fight in our minds. Psalm 119 says, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. That we're always thinking about the word of God. It is our first line of defense in thinking about what we see and what we experience in the world. I'm filling my mind with God and training myself to recognize and act on his truth instead of the pattern of the world. In John chapter eight, Jesus is speaking and it says to the Jews who had believed in Jesus, Jesus said this to them, and this is so important. <clears throat> if you hold to my teaching, if you cling to it, if you follow it, if you know it, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Logically, that leads me to this point. If we do not hold to the teachings of Jesus, if we do not cling to them, if we do not take them seriously and we truly are not following, we are not disciples of Jesus. We are not. We can attend church all we want, but if it's not working its way out in our lives in a real way, we're not disciples. If you hold to my teaching, if you get it in your bones, you get it in your mind and it works in your life, you really are my disciples. And here's the really important part. Listen, if you hold to it and cling to it, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you what? Free. Freedom comes from the way of Jesus. Freedom comes from holding to the teachings of Jesus. And if we're going to hold to teachings that Jesus has taught, it only makes sense to me that we know what they are. The only way to know what the teachings of Jesus are is found where? In the Word, in Scriptures. We must get Scriptures in our minds. If the only Scripture we get is a few slides on a Sunday, you cannot expect to experience life to the full in Christ. You cannot. We're fooling ourselves if that's what we think life is. You're missing out on life to the full. 
So I want you to ask yourself this question. <clears throat> Do I meditate on the scriptures? Do I? Do I know the scriptures? And if the answer is honestly no, I'm not here to make you feel bad. That's not my point. That's not ever what I like. I don't want to make you feel bad. I just want to ask you the next question. You know how important it is and it's not happening. So here's the question I want you to ask yourself next. What's my plan moving forward to ensure that I begin to get God's word into my life? What's my plan moving forward? What am I going to do today to change getting the word into my life? What's my plan moving forward? You need to formulate a plan. You need to have some resources. Here are three <coughs> I'm going to show you. Put that first one up if you would. Bibleproject.com. It's an app on your phone. It can get a, in the store. You can get it on your smart TV. It's on the, the interwebs, all right? It's there. It's anywhere you can go. What these people do, absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. They'll help you understand the Bible in ways you never have before. It has enriched my life. Personally, also as a pastor, my knowledge, I cannot talk about this enough as a great resource. I think everybody needs to employ this into your life. You learn so much about the scriptures through this resource of the thebibleproject.com. I want to talk so much about it, but I got to keep moving. Next one is this, <coughs> is uh, the YouVersion Bible app. That's what it looks like in the, the app store. <coughs> you need to get this. There are plans that you can use. They have reading plans. They have yearly reading plans. They have monthly reading plans. They have five-day plans. Like, I mean, you can find everything, and it's easy to understand, and it's incredible. I, I use that most every day of my life, right, the Bible app. It's absolutely wonderful. And then I partner the Bible app. This is just me, right? I use this common prayer book, um, and it's got prayers in there every day, things that you can pray. It has, has a gospel reading, a psalm reading, an Old Testament reading, uh, and also a New Testament reading. And it has prayers that you pray, and then it has a part where you pray for others around you, and you pray through the Lord's Prayer. I love having that routine in my life because left to my own devices I, I can get pretty lazy anybody else with me <laughs> right I can push that stuff to the side even though I know it's important it's helpful for me to have something to walk through it takes a little more time but it's okay that it takes a little more time <clears throat> these are just three there's probably a lot more but I recommend those very 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 much highly everybody good got to get the word in our lives we must uh, second weapon is this is the weapon of relationships, the weapon of relationships. Psalm 1 again, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or follow the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, or be like people who mock other people. In other words, who you choose to allow clo close access into your life goes a long way into shaping the person that you are. One of the most influential things on a person is another person. And so who we choose to do life with and to allow access into our lives goes a long way into the people that we become. And listen, it doesn't matter if you're a kid, an adolescent, <clears throat> or an adult. Relationships are powerful at every stage of life. Who we choose to allow close access into our lives goes a long way in becoming the person that we are. I've said this for years. <clears throat> I did a, over a decade as a student pastor, now over a decade as a pastor, and I believe this statement is still true that I used to say a lot more as a student pastor. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. We are shaped by the relationships that we choose in our lives, and so we must be wise in considering who we allow to be close to us. First Corinthians uh, <clears throat> 15.33 says, do not be misled, bad company, corrupts good character. We've all seen that play out in real life, and it's true, right? This isn't just about getting the wrong people out of your life. It's critical we get the right people in. We gotta establish right relationships. We can get rid of the bozos in our life, and that's fine, but if we're not replacing that with something good, with people of faith, people who are strong and mature, 
right? If we're not replacing that, we're just going to move on to the next weak relationship. Like we need the right people in our lives. People who aren't afraid to ask the tough questions. Who aren't afraid to say what's really going on. People we allow that we can be accountable to. It's absolutely critical that we have the right relationships. We have a family value in our church, a core value that says it this way. We are refreshed by relationships. The right people and the right relationships can be such a gift, such a gift. Finding the right people matters. Now, I just feel like I have to say this next. A good first step to find like-minded people and maybe some right relationships the way you can take a first step here at our church are in these things called, does anybody know? <clears throat> Life groups, small groups. January 30th, we're kicking off a brand new semester where people will get together. And we're focusing a lot on Bible studies this year where you can get together. We also have interest groups. You can get together with like-minded people, pray together, learn together, laugh together, and you can find the right relationships that can encourage you and push you towards life. It is a critical weapon in our arsenal, yes, and amen. Third weapon is the weapon of prayer. Prayer is an underutilized weapon that we often hurry through and only focus on ourselves. And when we do that, when it's just a list of our wants and our will to God, God, I need you to do this, we miss out on the power of prayer. I've said it a million times, this will make a million and one. The primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do the things we think God ought to be doing for us. The primary purpose of prayer is that we are properly formed and shaped into the image and likeness of Christ. If our prayer lives are not shaping us into the image and likeness of Christ, we are missing out on the power of prayer. We're missing out. I use this example often when I talk about prayer forming us and the purpose of it. Um, we, yes, we can pray for ourselves. I'm not saying not to, but if that's the only thing we do, we're missing out on prayer and the power of prayer. When Jesus tells us to pray for our enemies, I think the primary purpose in that is not that our enemies are changed first. I think the primary purpose of praying for our enemies is that our hearts are changed first. As we pray for God to bless even those who are against us, it softens our heart towards them. And when our hearts are changed towards our enemies, now peace, true peace is possible because somebody's now willing to take the first step towards peace. This is prayer properly forming us into the image and likeness of Christ, right? This is the power of prayer. It's why when Jesus says, when you pray, he gives us a way to pray because we think that prayer is found in the fancy words that we say or the many words that we say. I wanna read what Jesus said about prayer in Matthew <clears throat> chapter six. Jesus says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. In other words, that's all they're gonna get is the praise of other people. But he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And this should take the pressure off of our prayers. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. Don't pray for a long time. Amen, right? You have to keep on babbling. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. I love that. For your father knows what you need even before you ask. Just be authentic and be yourself before God. He knows. And I get this question a lot. If God knows what we need before we ask, why do we even need to pray? So that we are properly formed into the image and likeness of Christ. It's why we pray. Right? Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. We need to pay attention to what happens next. And so here's what Jesus says. This is how you should pray. And I want to give you a little bit about what runs through my mind when I pray through the Lord's Prayer. 
Jesus says, pray like this. What's the first word of the Lord's prayer? Our. Is that more than me? Yes, plural. Pronoun, I think, teachers, anybody? Our's a pronoun, yes? Okay, you don't know either. Our, I know this, it means more than one. And so what's the first word of the Lord's prayer? Tell me, this thing is bigger than me. This thing is not just about me. I belong to a community and to a family with a loving father. This is the way I've been formed to think about the Lord's prayer. And when I pray it, these are the things that run through my mind. And you can do this too. Our father in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. And sometimes in my mind, I will say, God, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And I'm reminded to honor and praise the name of the Lord, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your way, not my way first. Your will, not my will first. Be done. And how is it going to be done? On earth as it is in heaven. Who lives on earth to do the will of the Father? We do. We do, right? And so this is our responsibility together. Give us today our daily bread. Lord, I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I'm not going to worry about what lies in tomorrow. You already know. Lord, just help me to be satisfied with what you give and supply today. That's it. Forgive us our sin and our trespasses as we forgive those who sin and trespass against us. I'm not the only one who is offended. Everyone is offended. And Jesus loves and forgives me even when I offend him. So Lord, help me to be a person that forgives the way that you have forgiven me. Right? And let us not yield to temptation but deliver us from the evil one. That our power and our deliverance comes from God alone. And I'm gonna rely on him as opposed to anything else for life to the full. That's a prayer that can form you. And I would challenge you in your life, in your prayer life, pray through the Lord's Prayer. You can do it every day if you want. You can do it every other day, once a week. But think through it as you pray through it. Prayer is a weapon. Philippians 4 says, don't be anxious about anything. Easier said than done, right? Here's some steps you can take to not be as anxious. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And what happens when I begin to become a person of prayer? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and what? And your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the power and the weapon of prayer. Become a person of prayer, not just rattle through your list of wants and then you're done and telling God what to do. Take some time, pray through the Lord's prayer, pray genuinely for other people, trust that God has you and he does and he's with you and then move on, right? The weapon of prayer. Lastly, the weapon of worship, worship. So we've talked about about prayer, the word, relationships, and worship. And I know what you're thinking. Pat, aren't these the four habits that we're focusing on since like November? Yes, these are the same. They're that important. They're the habits we need in our lives. They are the weapons that transform and renew our minds. The last one is worship. What does worship mean? It means this, intentionally honoring God wherever your feet are. That's worship. It can happen when you sing. It can happen when you're at work. It can happen in the way that you treat your boss. It can happen in the way you are at school, at home, at Walmart, wherever you are, anything can become an act of worship to God. Think about that. Everything is sacred. Everything is sacred. And when our worldview is everything is sacred, I think that's when we tap into life to the full. That's when life begins to change. We honor God wherever our feet are wherever our feet are, regardless of what's happening around us. Uh, I'll wind down with this story. Uh, In the Acts of the Apostles, which is um, a letter that's written uh, by a guy. Does anybody know who wrote the Acts of the Apostles? Yeah, Luke. Uh, Luke also wrote the Gospel of Luke. Not a trick question, right? He wrote the Gospel of Luke, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. 
and then John, and then after John in our Bibles uh, comes the Acts of the Apostles. And the Acts of the Apostles is basically the, the story of the formation of the early church and what the church did, a lot of the history of how it began and what we should look like um, as a church. And kind of on down in the book, uh, or in the, the letter, I should say, uh, we find a guy named Paul, who we've talked about a lot, and a guy named Silas. And Paul and Silas uh, uh, have been out preaching the name of Jesus. And because they've committed that terrible crime, they have been thrown into a dungeon with other criminals who have stolen and murdered and all kinds of things in, in Rome. They're in a terrible dungeon for just speaking about love in the name of Jesus. That's it. And as they're in that dungeon, they have some decisions to make. Do we keep on? Do we quit? Do we give in to their demands to no longer speak the name of Jesus? What do we do? They've been beaten. They're in a tough situation. And they come to this conclusion. We can't control what's happening around us. But the one thing we can control is what we decide to do. And so what they decide to do is to honor God right where they are. They choose to worship him. And what their worship looked like in the place they were in was this, Acts 16, 25. It says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. They were praying and they were singing hymns to God in a pretty dark place. That's all they knew to do at the time was to worship God. They were praying and singing hymns, this is important, and the other prisoners were what? Listening to them. Can I please just encourage you, when you decide to honor God wherever you are, you never know the impact it could have on others around you. Honor God, worship him wherever you are. Everything is sacred, the good, even the difficult. So about midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And then suddenly, in verse 26, there was a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. Not only were they free, <clears throat> but everyone else was free around them all goes back to a decision to honor God where they were. I think we need to hear this today. Our freedom in Christ was never intended just to be for us. It was meant to be given. Christ has come to set us free. And if we are free, we are free indeed. And to walk in that freedom requires that we, we intentionally Worship God wherever we are. And the only way we're going to make that change is if our minds are renewed. And the only way to do that is to become a person of prayer, a person of the word, to have the right relationships, and to make the decision to honor God wherever we are to worship. This is how our minds are transformed and renewed. And so today I, I want us just to close out in a different way. I want us today to resolve and to commit, really commit to employ these weapons in our lives, to take the steps we need to take, to tear down the strongholds, the patterns of wrong thinking that we have in our lives, and to begin to put these weapons into practice in us.